أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين إنه خير ناصر ومعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman, salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all your a'mal, inshallah, that you performed. In the month of Ramadan, especially in these nights and the days of, of Laylat al-Qadr. Tonight, before beginning the topic, I just wanted to review some of the main points um, that we've covered in some of the lectures until now. Um, briefly, just to spend about a minute on this topic. One of the things that we've talked about is that we human beings have a goal, we have a purpose for why we are here in this world. And that purpose has come to us from God And that purpose is none other than to become a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah created us so that we can become His servants and His slaves So we have a goal which is set out for us Okay, so we have a goal, so who, so what? You know, why does it make a difference? We talked about how that goal should be something that inspires us to get working, to get busy. How to get that spiritual energy to like move towards that goal. And we, we were inspired from the Quranic story of Nabi Musa um, as to how, as to, as to, you know, trying to have that energy to become a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we also talked about how to cultivate that energy. What can we do in order to, to create that energy? And we talked about the need to have firm determination um, and to go through a mental thought process until we come to the realization that this is something that we have to do and then to make that firm resolution within us. So we have a goal and then we have motivation to work towards that goal. We have energy to work towards that goal inshallah. And then we talked about this idea that working towards this goal of becoming a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't mean that we have to abandon our lives, that we have to run away from everything that we're doing, whether it be studying, whether it be working, whether it be taking care of our kids, whether it be homemaking, whatever it is that our current duty is in life, becoming a servant of Allah SWT doesn't involve running away from it, but there is rather a way that we can engage in whatever occupation that we have to engage in, while still having the remembrance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and still progressing spiritually. Okay, so all this until now has been motivation, and it's been a high-level discussion about where we need to get to and generally speaking you know how we can get there but what we haven't talked about is some of the details of to, as, as to how can we actually on a day-to-day -day basis be making progress towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so tonight I wanted to spend a few minutes you know I don't want to belabor this too long just a few, minute, few minutes some minutes inshallah um, discussing some of the details as to how we can actually practice this and, uh, and in order to get into the details I'll have to go through some details now going through details it's only interesting for somebody who actually has been convinced about the other things right if somebody doesn't have that energy or they don't have that goal in the mind or they're like okay you know you're talking about that goal but I haven't taken that goal for myself then the details won't be too interesting to them but one day after all we have to cover that because I do know that there are some people who are interested in this also going through the details is more about saying what we ought to do and what we ought not to do it's not about 
you know, now, now the, the time for motivation and the time for ideology, that part is gone. Now it's time for discussing the details, so it'll be more of like what we should do and we, what we shouldn't do. Um, I would just ask brothers and sisters to please take this to heart, inshallah. Maybe it's something that, you know, it's, you, if you're not convinced about the first part, maybe we need to go back and think about it, you know, review the lectures, maybe we weren't you know, present for the lectures, fine. But at least for those who were, who were following along, who would like to get this more detailed information, please um, let us try to allow them to get that. And those who would like to hear more details, please say salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah. So anybody who has a goal and knows that they have to get to that goal and then they know that they have that energy that's going to propel them, what they now need to do is to make a plan for themselves. They need to figure out how to organize themselves so they can be moving towards that goal. Like for example, you're told that you have to go from San Jose to San Francisco and there's a good reason to do that. You're given a vehicle, the vehicle has enough gas you have your GPS, right? And now you're going you're gonna to press that button on the GPS to calculate. To figure out that route that will take you from San Jose to San Francisco. So it's the same thing when it comes to our goal now. Our goal is to become a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright, we need to make that a clear goal, we have to plan for it. And now we need to start working towards that. And well, in order to do that, we need to have a plan and we need to schedule our day accordingly. We have to be working according to a schedule. Okay, this is something which is necessary and this is something that's emphasized in the hadith as well too that we shouldn't be people who don't really have in mind what they're going to be doing in the daytime. The reason is because this whole world works on a system of uniformity, of working according towards schedule. If you look at the universe around you, you'll see that everything is operating according to certain schedules. Allah SWT says in Surah Yunus, Surah number 10, verse number 5, that He is the one who created the sun, which has a radiance, you know, it radiates light, and the moon is a light. He created it so that the moon has certain phases, that you might be able to know the number of years and calculate time on that basis. And Allah did not create all that except with reason. There is a reason why God created this. He elaborates the science for people who have knowledge. Now somebody who looks at the precise nature of the universe, the fact that the moon has certain times when it rises and when it sets, the way that the sun has certain times when it rises and it sets. If you look at the whole precision of how the sun and the moon are such that they never will run into each other and um, you know, they'll, they, they, they complement each other when it comes to filling up the sky for us. Everything is there for a particular plan and schedule. And we ourselves, when we see this, when we see all the dif different beings in the universe working according to a schedule, we can be inspired as well too. That what am I doing here, not being organized about what I do in my life? I'm seeing when I wake up in the morning, I don't have any plan for what I'm going to do. I just take things the way they come. You know, I know I have a general vague idea. Okay, I wake up in the morning. Okay, I have to like you know, eat breakfast, whatever. But if I have vacation, right, then. I just go sit on the couch, turn on the TV and see what happens. See who calls me, see who texts me. Right? And then on the basis of that, I'll figure out my schedule. No. If I look at the rest of the universe, it is working and operating on the basis of harmony and schedule and precision. So I myself need to follow suit. This is the way that the, the, the Ahlul Bayt al were. They, they were people who were very precise about their time. Every hour, they would have particular supplications and particular ibadah that they would perform and they wouldn't waste their time just spending a time same time with just anyone um, at any time even in the lives of the scholars we see the same type of seerah they say that Imam Khomeini rahmatullahi, rahmatullahi was so precise about his time that people would set their clocks, their wristwatches on the basis of his movements you know, he, every day he would, at exactly the same time, he would you know, go from here to here and then he would, for example, get, get ready for salat by doing wudu. They would know exactly what time it was by the movements of Imam Khomeini. They say that Ustad Ja'afari, uh, Alama ja, Muhammad Taki Ja'afari, one of the other great scholars of, of the past century, you know, he wrote the most magnificent um, sharh that we have of Nahja Balagha uh, to date. He would be somebody that you could ask him at any time, what time is it? And he would tell you what time it is. 
Okay, now this, okay, this, this isn't too cool. I mean, it's not too interesting. Okay, I can just do that. I can do the same thing. Right? I can pull out my phone and say, what time is this, right? It's one thing to know the time, but then that is a sign that he himself was somebody who operated on the basis of time. One time there was a student who wanted to ask him some questions. And he told him that, you know what, I don't have time for you in my schedule. But he, was just, he had finished one lecture and then the student had come running to him. He said, I have some questions. He said, I have to go to another thing. I'm, I'm busy. I can't make time for you. But he said, if you want, you can hop in the taxi with me and then ask me questions along the way. And then, you know, once, once I get to my destination, then you can find a way back here. So then the student, student agrees, so okay, fine. Right. Another scholar, scholar Ayatollah Baheshti, Shaykh Baheshti, who we mentioned last night, it's the same sort of thing happened to him. He said that, I, I can't make time in my schedule for you, but there's a time slot opening up next week when I'll be traveling from Qum to Tehran by bus. It's about you know, three hours by bus. He says, during a part of that time, I'll be resting. I need that time to rest. But some part of the time, I'll be awake and I'll be free. If you want, you can ride on the bus with me from Qum all the way to Tehran, ask me your questions and find your way back again. That's how jealously they guarded their time. That's how much precision and organization they had in their lives. And look at what levels they reached it. So this is inspiration for us as well. Please say salawat ana Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, if we want to organize our time, how do we do it? On what basis should we divide our time? According to the sum of Islamic teachings that we have from the Quran, from the Ahadith, and this, of course, I've taken from with, in consultation with, with my teachers who have you know, a, a grasp of, of the entire corpus of Islamic teachings. What they say is that we want to divide our time into three buckets. Okay? First of all, there's some part of our time which we do not have control over. It's been taken over because of the responsibilities that we have to fulfill, depending on what we're doing in our lives. Some of you, some of us are, are for example, we're working people. Okay, well, that's something that we're doing. We don't have a choice in that matter. We have to work. That, type, that time is, is accounted for. Some of us go to school. Right, from, say from 7.30 in the morning to like 2.30, I'm in school. Well, that part of my time, day is accounted for. Okay, some part of the day I have to sleep. Okay, now that's a discussion to be had there about how much should we sleep. Sleeping too much can be harmful for us. Sleeping too little can be harmful for us as well too. But let's put that aside for the moment. Um, the point is that there's some time that we're sleeping. On the average, somebody who reaches maturity, they need about 7 hours of sleep in the day. So, if you take out the time that is taken away from us, either because of, our, because of our occupations, because of sleep, we're left with a certain amount of free time. Let's say anywhere between 7 hours, 6 hours to like, let's say 10 hours, depending on whatever we are, whatever state we're in. This is something that we need to go home and then calculate. Now with this free time, how do we divide it? The advice is to divide it into three buckets. Bucket number one is learning. Islamic learning. Bucket number two is ibadah, worship. And bucket number three is everything else that we need to do in order to be successful in the other two buckets. Okay? Islamic learning, worship, and then miscellaneous. Now when we say miscellaneous, I don't mean to say that it's something that is extraneous. That it's something which is extra that you can toss out the window. That we should just, in our free time, we should just do Islamic learning and ibadah. No, that's not what's intended because as we talk about, you need, we need these as well too. But just as a breakdown. Now, when we talk about Islamic learning, you know, um, that in includes any type of learning we may do about our duties when it comes to God. Because we want to become slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to be His servants. We need to know what is it that He wants of us. So whether it be reading books, whether it be listening to lectures, whether it be asking questions, whether it be um, reading useful websites, whether it be watching useful videos on YouTube, or even if it be other types of learning that aren't directly um, you know, related to taking the, you know, the teachings, but indirectly take us to God. For example, somebody can watch a documentary about the way the universe works, like something amazing about nature, and that can be something which educates them about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the design, the knowledge, and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's different, this is something which is, we should think a little bit wider than just the traditional ways of learning. Even if somebody, for example, were to go and ask questions of, of somebody who could give them the answer, somebody who's qualified, that would, be, that would qualify as Islamic learning. So that's one category. The second category we talked about was? was what? 
Worship. Good, thank you. One brother is, is alhamdulillah with us. Worship. Now worship means those obligations that we have from God and those other things that we want to do for God's sake. And these are divided into two categories. One of them is personal devotion and the other one is social devotion. We have responsibilities when it comes to our personal connection with God like prayers, and fasting, etc. Right? And these, these take up some of our time. And then some of it is with regards to our social obligations. Okay, for example, you know, people who are, let's say they're teaching in the Sunday school. That's something that's an obligation because we need to you know, carry on, impart knowledge to the next generation. That's something that's a duty of theirs. Okay, somebody who, who organizes events and participates with the youth, for example, that's something that's a duty as well too. The third bucket, which is what? Miscellaneous, okay? Not extraneous, right? Miscellaneous. That's everything that we need in order to be successful in performing the other things. Okay? For example, for example, we have to have relationships with other people. Okay, and those take time as well too. We have to have friends that are decent, that, that are not people who are forgotten about God, that take us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to have relationships with our family as well too. We need to keep ourselves clean. We need, you know, like whatever it needs, we need whatever, how much ever, whatever time we need in order to do that. We need to do exercise as well too. That's something that's necessary. We need to eat. That's also something that's necessary as well too. We need to ha enjoy ourselves in an Islamically appropriate way. That's something which is necessary. So all of these will have a claim to our time as well. Okay. So now, now we understand that there's three general buckets. Now the question that comes up now is how do I distribute my time when it comes to these three things? The answer is that when it comes to priority, the thing which has the highest priority is the first bucket. Okay, and then the ibadah, and then the third category. But again, all three are necessary. But when it comes to the free time that I have, if I've taken care of all three, and I have a choice as to where to put in the extra time, okay, where am I going to put it into? Which, which bucket? The first one, Hassan. Okay, I'm going to put it in the first one, which is Islamic learning. Okay, now... This thing is something, this is, this is an understanding that we have to come to, we have to realize, we have to believe in it. Okay, the importance of Islamic learning is not something that's just for somebody who decides to go off to Qum or, or Najaf or something and study Islam. No. All of us, we, if we want to perform the duties that God wants us to do, we have to know what it is. We have to be very clear about these things. Whether it comes to, to the ethical teachings of Islam, whether it comes to the practical teachings, the practical laws, whether it comes to the beliefs. A brother was telling me that you know, he's, he, he wants to be able to respond to the atheist, but he can't do so. That means that when it comes to a fundamental part of belief, which is, you know, knowing on a logical level why God exists, that hasn't become clear. Now it's good, mashallah, I'm very happy that he's asking that question, but we have to ask ourselves, do we, have we even established that much? Right? Because then that's the fundamental pinnacle. How are we going to grow if we haven't even established that much for ourselves, which is why is it that God exists? And then, you know, furthermore, you know, what is it, what are the attributes of God? Um, you know, why is it that the prophets have to be human beings? If the prophets are sent, why do they have to be infallible um, or in, in, um, inerrant, etc., etc.? Right? These are things, they are serious questions that we need to get ironed out and, and solve for ourselves. Now, when I say that um, we need to make sure that we, we, we don't sacrifice, and when I say that we want to put the, the time that we have, if we have extra time, we put it into the first bucket, it, didn't, it means that we cannot... It doesn't mean that we should sacrifice on the other two. The other two are necessary as well. When it comes to the ibadah, the ibadah section, the worship, at the first level we have to understand that there's some things which are obligatory on us, so we have to perform. Okay, and then there's some things that are not required, but they're recommended. But if we want to be able to perform the required things, then we have to need to do these recommended things as well. Okay, for example, if there's somebody who says that, okay, I'm committing myself to being a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to do what God wants me to do, I'm going to perform my obligations. Okay. Is it enough to just say that? Because if you just say that, then how are you going to know whether you fulfilled it or not? It's not, it's not like we can go in and you know, check some website to see how well we did or not. Right? We ourselves are responsible for testing ourselves. We have to check whether or not it worked out or not. So that leads us to needing to have a way of measuring how we're doing. And that comes in two forms. One of them is in the form of muraqaba and the other comes in the form of muhasaba. 
Muhasaba is the Islamic teaching of spending some time at the end of the day, some minutes, reviewing the deeds that we did. And in this process of reviewing, if we did something good, we thank Allah for it by saying Alhamdulillah. If we did something which was not good, which was not appropriate, befitting of a slave, of Allah, then we seek Allah's forgiveness, Astaghfirullah. And we say it, Alhamdulillah, or say it, Astaghfirullah. Now this process in itself, you know, when I think that, okay, what's the big deal? Actually, it's a very big deal because it will start to help us become better and better. It's not just about starting out and then we're done. No, this is something which will, will revise, will change, will be always, you know, a, a good plan is a plan that's flexible. It has room for changing and it can be molded according to the needs. We'll start to realize what kind of people we are. How much of the day we spend not even aware of what we're doing. At the end of the day, we'll be like, we'll start looking at our actions and we'll be like, okay, from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock, I had no control over myself whatsoever. I was saying anything that came to my mind. I was looking wherever I wanted to. I was spending time with anybody I wanted to. I had no checks and balances over me. The other component which I said was the muraqaba is being aware of what we're doing. Going about doing things with an awareness and watching over ourselves. And as if we're, we have a, you know, a camera over ourselves watching every step that we do. Okay? Now, the, the third category, which is the category of, of the miscellaneous, okay, um, this is something which is essential. Nobody should imagine that they can sacrifice on things like not having fun or, for example, not doing exercise or um, not sleeping or whatever it is. These things are absolutely necessary if we want to attain any closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is from the advice of the Ahlul Bayt. They tell us, for example, if somebody doesn't have some time where they enjoy themselves in a halal way, then they will not be able to succeed when it comes to any other thing, whether it be their knowledge or when it, whether it comes to their worship. Now, there's a lot of discussion to be had here about within each one of these categories exactly how much time we should spend, what exactly we should do. The format for that though is not a lecture. In a lecture, the idea is just to inspire, give the basics, and then those who wish to take this upon themselves, it's up to them to pursue it, and maybe setting up seminars, or maybe asking on an individual basis, whatever it may be. I just want to summarize and end up the discussion by making three observations of things that, inshallah, we would have learned from this discussion. Number one, is that when we look at the advice of the Ahlul Bayt about how to divide our day, they're very particular that have some time and divide it, actually divide it. Don't be one of these people who lets everything flow into everything else. Where at all times you're doing everything. Okay, one of my friends, he went to visit somebody and um, you know, he went to, he just he wanted to like, you know, spend some time with him. And this, was a, this man was a businessman. And he had his phone with him. Okay, and you know, he was sitting with him and they were chatting, the phone would ring, okay, he deal with his business call, right? They go to dinner, they're starting to eat, okay, the phone will ring, he went to business call. Right? They're sitting with the family afterwards, phone will ring, business call. Finally, he, just got, he got fed up, he said, that, just turn off the phone. You know, what's the big deal? Okay, just put, out, put it off for tomorrow, right? Why are you mixing the, the part, that part of your life with this part of life? The teachings of Ahlul Bayt is no. When it comes to doing your, whatever has a demand on your time, like work or whatever it is, you do that. And you, you put your heart and soul into it. Of course, without forgetting about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when it comes time to enjoy yourself, you do that with your heart and soul as well too. Don't be thinking about that thing when you're doing this thing. And that's something which is different than the type of lifestyle that, you know, with modern technology, we're, we're taught to lead. I mean, when it comes to work and, you know, the things that are going on at work, there used to be a time when, when you leave work, you don't come back to it until the next morning. But now, with email and with, you know, email coming on your, on your phone, then you're always in touch with work. No, that's not the right type of attitude. Observation number two is that if somebody were to sacrifice in one of these three, they will not be able to succeed in the other two. For example, let's take worship. Okay, worship is essential to our being. It's something we need in order to keep our hearts alive, to keep in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Suppose that somebody gets so busy with work or school that they sacrifice on their worship. They're going to see the effect. What should have been a means for them to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will no longer be that means. Somebody is so busy taking care of their children that they forget about praying on time. They forget about spending time for themselves, having that private time with them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you.
um, they'll, they won't be able to even raise their children properly. Because they won't have, the best way of raising our children and to inspire them is to have that within ourselves. That connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we talk about Allah, it comes out from the heart. But if we ourselves don't have that heartful connection with Allah, how can we inspire anybody, let alone our children? The third observation I want to make about this is that Please say salawat on Muhammad wa Muhammad. Muhammad. Is that if it ever comes to be the case that we have a bit of free time, let's take charge of that free time. Let's actually take it within our possession. Not let other things come and take that free time away from us. A lot of times people get a moment of free time, like, oh, what should I do right now? Because they don't have a good schedule in mind. They don't have that motivation. They don't have that driving factor that, okay, these are my three buckets of time. I need to make sure I'm getting everything taken care of. What they do is they're like, they don't know what to do. They're like, okay, well, let me just go on the web. Let's see what's going on on Facebook. All right? And then that can turn into like five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, etc. And then wasting the time that we've already talked about. That is not the Islamically you know, inspired way that we're trying to, we're understanding of how to manage our day. We need to take control of our time and be sure that we have everything scheduled and managed. May Allah SWT help us in achieving um, proximity to Him inshallah by having a firm goal in mind and putting in our utmost efforts by scheduling our time and learning what we need to in order to put these ideas into practice. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. If there's any question that one of the things that we've talked about is that we human beings have a goal, we have a purpose for why we are here in this world and that purpose has come to us from God and that purpose is none other than to become a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah created us so that we can become His servants and His slaves so we have a goal which is set out for us okay so we have a goal so who so what you know why does it make a difference we talked about how that goal should be something that أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين إنه خير ناصر ومعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين. inspires us to get working, to get busy. How to get that spiritual energy to like move towards that goal? And we, we were inspired from the Quranic story of Nabi Musa alayhi salam, um, as to how, as to, as to, you know, trying to have that energy to become a slave of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And then we also talked about how to cultivate that energy. What can we do in order to to create that energy. We talked about the need to have firm determination um, and to go through a mental thought process until we come to the realization that this is something that we have to do and then وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman, salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all your a'mal, inshallah, that you performed. In the month of Ramadan, especially in these nights and the days of, of Laylat al-Qadr. Tonight, before beginning the topic, I just wanted to review some of the main points um, that we've covered in some of the lectures until now. Um, briefly, just to spend about a minute on this topic. <coughs> 